Hello, everyone. Uh, good to see you all, uh, or at least be aware that you're all online this evening for this event, and you're all very welcome. Let me straight away introduce our distinguished panelists. Kevin E. Dovid is a senior lecturer in modern history at the University of Sheffield. She's the author of From Parnell to Paisley, Constitutional and Revolutionary Politics in Modern Ireland. Martin Manser is a politician and historian. He's a former Fianna Fáil TD, Minister of State, and advisor to the Irish government on Northern Ireland. Indeed, he has written and lectured extensively on the peace process. Margaret O'Callaghan is a historian and political analyst in the School of History at Queen's University, Belfast. Amongst her publications, she has written on British high politics and nationalist Ireland. And Morris Manning is a former Fine Gael TD and leader of the Senate. He has been president of the Irish Human Rights Commission and is presently chancellor of the National University of Ireland. He is a biographer of John Dillon, who I suspect will feature in this discussion, the last leader of the Irish Parliamentary Party. Welcome to you all. We gather, don't we, against the sombre background with the actions of President Putin in Ukraine highlighting the clash between empire and self-determination which was at the core of the Irish question in the 19th century and the early part of the 20th. Uh, Kiva uh, Nidarbin, if I could start with you, was partition of Ireland inevitable? Well, um, thanks Seamus, that's a nice uh, straightforward question to start us off with tonight. Um, so my view is, uh, historians don't really like uh, you know, acknowledging anything is, is inevitable that kind of denies human agency and the contingency of events. But on balance, I think that some form of separate provision for Ulster, whatever Ulster is taken to mean, um, is likely, is more likely than not by the summer of 1914. Now, that's not to say that partition in the form that it, uh, that it has become was inevitable. But I think some form of separate provision for Ulster is likely by, by, the, by the outbreak of the First World War. Now, whether that is temporary, whether that would be temporary exclusion or permanent exclusion, whether that would be sort of home rule within home rule, uh, as was being discussed at the time, whether that be for all of Ulster or for six counties or for four counties, those were all issues yet to be resolved. But my view is that some form of separate provision for, for Ulster, for at least some part of Ulster, was likely. And of course, you know, the events that unfolded from 1919 to 1920 through 1920 and into 1921 themselves shaped, you know, the final settlement or what was what turned out to be the final settlement. So I think we need to look at what was likely at certain points in time and how they were how those that those likelihoods were buffeted by by the rising, by the conscription crisis, by the revolution, by uh, by the government of Ireland Act, by all of the events that we know that that contributed to the to the final to the establishment of the Northern Irish Parliament, which in which, which we will do uh, in the next hour or so. But Martin Manser, your belief is, I understand, that it wasn't inevitable, but it gradually became so. Why? Well, I mean. Looking at it at the rational level, which of course <laughs> is not the way one should look at politics, I mean, home rule was actually a compromise. The union would have continued, but you would have had self government um, uh, for Ireland. Um, but it became rapidly embroiled from 1886 on in uh, British politics. I would say, you know, the issue was was weaponized. And of course, in 1911 um, uh, or 1912, Bona Law um, backed uh, the Ulster resistance to home rule to the hilt and saying he there was no step they could take that he would imagine that he wouldn't be um, uh, able to support. And of course, the Cara Mutiny, which uh, Churchill was, um, you know, behind causing in some ways, um, I mean, demonstrated that the British government were not willing to impose. So, I mean, it was a question of forces. But now, I mean, one of the things that I would um, feel is that the nationalist leadership, first of all, 
the Home Rule Party and then later uh, Sinn Féin uh, didn't pay their cards very well. I mean, they were obviously quite quite entitled to oppose partition in principle, but they were far too late in insisting um, that if partition was going to happen, um, then it shouldn't comprise any areas in which nationalists were in a majority. majority. I'm, I'm, I'm going to come back to that, Martin. I'm going yeah. to come back to that because uh, it's, it's something that we want to tease out among many of these strands that you're yeah. un, beginning to untangle uh, this evening so far. But Margaret, if I can go to you in the meantime, it's interesting what both uh, Kiva and Martin have said because they're going back to Home Rule times. Why, therefore, is there this perception that partition came out of the Anglo-Irish Treaty of 1921? In other words, that Michael Collins gave up the North with a stroke of a pen. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of answer it by also answering your other question. I mean, I probably don't really think partition was inevitable, but I don't necessarily think that even Home Rule was inevitable. So if you do go back to the 1880s and the 1890s, um, Martin talks about it as a compromise proposal. I mean, it was a compromise proposal that was consistently denied, first by the Tories and then in practice by the Liberals when they got into power in the early 20th century. So, I mean, there's a, so you've got this polarisation at the point of democratisation uh, in Ireland. Uh, home rules, hiatus period, if you like, entrenches division, that whole 1885 to say 1915 period. And uh, th that means that people have rehearsed opinions by the time you reach this odd situation where home rule for purely British reasons gets onto the statute book or gets well, all into I'm, the I'm, of I'm, in, the I'm interested though, I'm interested though, Margaret, in that perception that it all, it's all down to 1921 and the treaty. Uh, well, I don't know people, you know, people, there are different populist ideas of when Ireland was partitioned. Some people think it was the treaty, you know, the whole mechanics of what went on from, I suppose, the proposals, as Creevers mentioned, of 1916, uh, the post-war kind of 1918, putting the Irish thing on ice, uh, then having the extreme unionist Walter Long devising the form that a so-called partition would take. So, be, uh, I mean, as Creevers says, the likelihood of maybe some special provision for a part of Ulster was possibly likely from 14 or 16 onwards. But the particularly radical form it took was a big surprise. So the Government of Ireland Act, I suppose, can be seen as a radically new piece of legislation All right. rather well, we, than just we, a fourth Home Rule Bill. We will be coming back to that. And, and thank you for bearing with me as we move through the, the discussion. Um, Morris, to come to you, you do believe, do you, that it was inevitable? It is, it's as plain as that, as far as you're concerned. Morris, you'll have to unmute. Followed your instructions too okay. carefully at the beginning. You, you do believe that it was inevitable? Well, apart from taxes and debt, few things are inevitable. And, but I think there were a number of factors missing, which made it more likely. The first was the absence of constitutional imagination or experimentation on the part of the British who thought persistently, consistently in imperial terms. And the irony is that the empire was on the brink of hugely radical changes in its structure and in the role of the states within it and so on. But very little of this thinking of thinking, was there a different way uh, of resolving the Irish thing? But the biggest uh, factor making partition of some sort certain was the absence of a will to compromise. There was no compromise on the part of Craig and the Unionists. They knew what they wanted, they had a very clear idea of what they wanted, they got what they wanted and with the Government of Ireland Act that was copper fastened. So against that, even if Sinn Féin did have a clear idea, which they didn't, of what sort of an Ireland would have ensued, how they would have accommodated uh, the million, million and a half unionists who were totally opposed to it. And they didn't have any sense of how that would be. So given 
the sort of the component par parts, the absence of a will to compromise and the absence of maybe more imaginative constitutional structures, which might have worked, but that was, we're thinking way ahead of what the best thinking of the time was. I think those two factors did make it largely inevitable. And, and Martin, I, I want to go back to what you were talking about earlier, around about uh, 1912, the signing of the Ulster Covenant. You referred to Carson and Bonner Law. Uh, they're making speeches threatening. There's no length of resistance to which Ulster will not go. Was that the turning point, Martin? Uh, my father, who was a historian, certainly thought Bonar Law's role was absolutely crucial um, in, in 1912. But you see, there is the curious thing is that if unionists hadn't been in a position, Ulster unionists, to define the territory that became Northern Ireland, if they'd been told, well, no, actually, you can't have Fermanagh and Tyrone, and you can't have Derry, and you can't have Murray, and so on, would that have caused a bit of a rethink? Because there was a huge effort made in the Irish Convention by uh, uh, a large number of the Southern Unionists coming together with the constitutional nationalists to try and prevent partition, which was, of course, um, uh, the Southern, uh, Southern Unionist nightmare. Um, so, and Lloyd George admitted privately uh, that nobody was going to fight, no, nobody, no British was going to fight over Fermanagh and Tyrone. And David Trimble, for example, in his um, pamphlet, The Foundation of Northern Ireland, um, takes the view that nationalists uh, let those slip through their fingers. All right, well, well uh, Martin has, has sort of pinpointed that period, the role of, of Carson, the role of, of Bonner Law. Uh, Kiva, on the eve of war, uh, if we can come up to that point now, in, in this very rapid, I, I accept that, a survey of, of events uh, as they progress, but then events were happening very quickly at that time. And on the eve of war, it, it's obvious, isn't it, that Ireland will be divided? The only question is how. But, but Kiva... Was partition inevitable at that point, on the eve of, of the First World War? Oh, well, no, I mean, on the eve of the First World War, you know, the Easter Rising hasn't happened. Um, the IPP, the Irish Parliamentary Party, still are the dominant political bloc commanding, you know, the, the vast majority of, of electoral support among within Nationalist Ireland. Um, you know, we can raise some questions about the depth of that support, and there's been some work done to suggest that it's actually a bit more shallow uh, that, than, we, than it might look at first glance, and that helps to explain the rapidity with which it fell away um, in 1918. Um, but I think on the eve of war, you know, I don't think you could, nobody could have imagined, you know, the speed at which events would unfold and the way in which the moderates, you know, Mar Morris or Martin Mann mentioned Southern Unionists, but also constitutional nationalists, the so-called moderates um, become are, are outflanked so quickly um, through, in spite of efforts like the the Buckingham Palace Conference, the Irish Convention. You know, by the time the elect the election of 1918 is held, you know, there's a quite rapid political realignment. Um, that, that means that you're kind of dealing with a very different electoral landscape and that makes different political calculations and political judgments possible. Um, I mean, I sort of agree with some of what Margaret said that, you know, in the end, you kind of have a failure of some political imagination. You have kind of a blunt tool via the Government of Ireland Act that is kind of, you know, run through Parliament. No Irish or Northern Irish MP votes for it at all. You know, unionists abstain nationalists are not present. The one nationalist MP who is there, T.P. O'Connor, who's an MP, oh. the la one of the last nationalist MPs for Liverpool, he votes against it. So, you know, it, it, we do have this spectacle of, of a British parliament um, passing legislation that no Irish person ever voted for. Okay. Um, so that has to be borne in mind as well. Thank you, Kim. I want to ask both Margaret and Morris uh, about uh, uh, the question of what allies the, if any, the, the Southern Unionists had. I want a, a quick word from Morris on that first, and then I'll go to you, Margaret. I mean, the, 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 the issue is that home rule legislation, Morris, is passed, but suspended on the outbreak of war. The 1916 rising reopens the issue. Uh, I'm, I'm just filling in a bit here, as I, as I will do throughout. In December 1916, Lord George overthrows Asquith. He's supported by the, the Conservatives. Nationalist uh, positions are weakened, but Southern Unionists fear 
uh, isolation in a Catholic dominated state. Now, the question is, Morris, do they have any clout still at Westminster? Do they have allies at Westminster, Morris? I think, I think they very quickly and very painfully found that they had very few friends, that when it came to their uh, allies on the country, the Northern Unionists, when push came to shove, they were very quickly ditched there without any great uh, sense of regret on the part of the Unionists who had got, the Ulster Unionists who had got what they wanted. And they were, they did see themselves as friendless and vulnerable, but they did have the huge economic clout which yes. the Southern Unionists had in what became the 26, or what in the 26 counties, their control of, of the banks, or what industry there was, landowners, insurance companies, all of that. And they very quickly uh, discovered that there was no uh, appetite whatsoever on the part of the leaders of either side in our civil war uh, to make, any, make the new state anything but a welcome place for the leaders of Irish of Southern Unionism, who very quickly found themselves comprising a large part of the Senate consulted by the new government, courted by de Valera when it came to his turn, so that politically, they were sure. now there are many things you probably want to come later about how the overall Protestant or uh, community in the Republic, in the South. Indeed, we're, 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 le we're leaping but, ahead quite a bit there. But in political terms, the question you asked me there was they had few allies and they very quickly realised that there was no mood to be vindictive towards them and that the leaders, at least, of both the major parties wanted them as partners. Uh, Margaret, you can deal with that question about the allies or lack of them that the Southern Union has had. But I want to also ask you about a more general uh, issue. How much of a factor, Margaret, in partition were these constantly changing political developments in Britain and Ireland during that wartime period? Well, on the Allies point, I suppose Allies are only useful if they can do anything for you. And the only person, the only people with power in all of what we're talking about is the British government, certainly up to the point at which the Free State is established. So the only useful ally to have is, and Martin's earlier point about Boner Law's crucial role in solidifying and lending backbone and future capacity uh, to the Ulster Unionist position is due to the strength of their allies. Um, on uh, what was your other question? Well, the, the, the issue, what I wanted to know from you was, how much of a factor in partition were there constantly changing political developments in Britain? Oh, well, well, I mean, the, 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 the fact that, there were, that they weren't changing that much from 1918 onwards is important as well, because you had Lloyd George constantly dependent upon a Tory cabinet throughout that entire period. So it, although you'd Walter Long for the first year or two controlling the cabinet committee, and laying down really the ground markers for what we got, uh, people chatting away to Craig, so he could say if he wanted six, nine or four counties. And then really after Lloyd, after Long ceases to be a factor, there are always the diehard Tories there in the long grass. So it's quite interesting that Lloyd George managed to actually negotiate a treaty in the latter part of 1921, that he got people like Birkenhead on board, that he took uh, people like um, Chamberlain with him, because there were strong forces within the Tory party that would have gone the Henry Wilson way or a far right. harder way. So there are a lot of counterfactual ways we can think about the period, I suppose. Okay, uh, the, the long committee uh, appointed by the government was what in effect, was the body which, in effect, came up with the legislation which which became the Government of Ireland uh -huh. Act in 1920. Uh, Martin, to go, to go back to you, uh, Ireland partitioned then under the Government of Ireland Act 1920, but that act never was implemented in the rest of Ireland. What did the act mean, Martin, for Southern Ireland at that point? What did the Government of Ireland 1920 Act mean for Southern Ireland? 
Well, it, it sim simply meant that the British government was completely ignoring the 1918 general election result um, uh, and who was deciding uh, uh, to go its own way. Um, I should make a, a point that in the Government of Ireland Act 1920, there are the provisions for the Council of Ireland. Yeah, and sure. something, something that is very ill understood is that that was originally a Carsonian proposal at the Irish Convention and Walter Long put it in as a means of reassuring Southern Unionists mm. that partition wouldn't be absolutely complete. Um, it's, it, 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 it's completely misinterpreted um, uh, to regard it as a, 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 as a, a concession uh, to nationalist. Nationalist Ireland had no interest in the Council of Ireland in the 1920-25 period. Now, I mean, as with regard to a sort of a Southern Unionist, I mean, there was talk about allies there. Of course, they lost Lord Lansdowne when he made ill-time proposals for peace with Germany at the end of 1916. You see, he'd helped veto bringing in home rule in June, July 1916. He was a powerful uh, cabinet member. But I mean, out of the deal, um, uh, there was um, uh, proportional representation, and uh, which has thankfully remained. Um, and as Morris pointed out, um, uh, you know, the Senate has allowed um, uh, representation of minorities. What happened after, after uh, uh, partition is you had in the Republic, or what were no, sorry, the free state that became the Republic for the first generation, you had a classic post-colonial situation where, if you like, the former uh, people who'd been passed still had a lot of influence, in, particularly in business, professions, uh, land ownership, even if they didn't get much involved in politics. Right. Okay. Well, to go back to you, Morris, then, on, on this question, which has already been referred to, and that is uh, you know, that nationalists uh, had no input into that 1920 legislation, uh, not least because Sinn Féin weren't taking their seats at Westminster. There were seven Irish nationalist MPs instead of 80. The question is, Morris, would Sinn Féin's 73 seats have made any difference to the passage of that Government of Ireland Act if there were over 500 MPs supporting it? That's one of these... <laughs> Things I don't. I think it's an impossible question to answer, Shabas, because the the mood of most of those MPs would not permit them to participate in the Westminster Parliament, and their mindset was against it. So I think it's one of these questions we can say: Would the presence of Sinn Fein during the Brexit debates maybe have changed the course of British history, contemporary <laughs> British history during the time of that hung Parliament? So um, I can't answer that. Kiva, to come back to you, um, what, ha what happened in the elections to the Parliament of Southern Ireland? I'll talk about the Northern Ireland elections, the very first ones in just a moment, but I'm interested, Kiva, as we're talking about a Southern perspective this evening, what happened in the elections for the Parliament of Southern Ireland in May 1921? Well, uh, these elections were held, but the seats were uncontested. Under the, under the Government of Ireland Act. Right. Exactly, precisely. So the elections were held and to a certain extent Sinn Féin participated in, in the elections, but with the stated intention of maintaining their abstentionist policy and continuing to sit in Dáil Éireann. Um, you know, there was no recognition of the legitimacy. So it's kind of a curious episode, actually, because on the one hand, they reject the legitimacy of the British Parliament to legislate um, to legislate for Ireland and to, uh, you know, hold elections to which, uh, you know, and they reject the whole premise of the Government of Ireland Act. But on the other hand, they, you know, they need to continue to show that they maintain the support of the population. Um, so so the, the elections take place, but Sinn Féin candidates are unopposed in virtually every Southern constituency. Um, so it's kind of a curious election in that very few people in in what became the in Southern Ireland cast actually went and cast a vote in in a ballot in a ballot station, um, you know there's a few Unionist MPs who are returned um, who do you know turn up on the day the Southern Parliament is due to open and it's all a big kind of charade, um, but uh, you know we can look at the 1921 election as a kind of example of the continued democratic legitimacy of Sinn Fein, but we should also remember the local government elections which which had been held. 
1920, in both January and June, um, which, which, at which Sinn Féin shot the board in both, both rural and urban district councils. Um, and I just want to add that you know, the proportional representation is, is introduced for these local government elections, and th this is continued for the Government of Ireland elections. And it's not really, you know, we rightly see proportional representation nowadays as a means of protecting minorities. Um, and a way of ensuring minority representation, but but at least part of what is going on with with using proportional representation in 1920 and 1921 is to try and give you know the moderates a way back into the political system to try and see can the IPP pick up a few votes, can they maintain a presence, can they kind of disrupt this narrative of of Sinn Féin dominance? But as it turns out, they couldn't not at least not in in what in Southern Ireland slash the Irish Republic as it was then. Uh, Martin, I, I want to come to you and ask you, what, what's become of the Irish Parliamentary Party uh, during this period? Essentially the Home Rule Party, representing Irish nationalists at Westminster, the party of Parnell, Redmond, Dillon and Joe Devlin, of course, a very familiar name uh, uh, in, in this part of, our, of the island. What happens to the Irish Parliamentary Party? Well, um, they won half the nationalist seats uh, in Northern Ireland, or what was to become Northern Ireland. So they did survive there and they had a pact with Sinn Féin. And I think they also won a seat uh, in Waterford. Mm. But of course, in the course of the 20s, um, you know, uh, the Redmondite influence, if you like, uh, reformed itself. And it was one of the constituent elements that went into the making of Fine Gael. And of course, the leader of the last, uh, the last leader of the Irish Parliamentary Party, John Dillon, uh, was succeeded, um, uh, or, or his, his heritage uh, was taken on by his son, who eventually became leader of Fine Gael, and of course, Morris Manning was his biographer. <laughs> well, let's hear from his biographer. What, what did become of them, Morris? First of all, can you hear me? Because part of my screen has disappeared, but you can't Yes, we, we can hear you and, and see you. Good, yeah. well, that's, that's, well, James Dillon, as a young man, visited Westminster after his father had lost his seat. And he was absolutely appalled by what he saw as the remnants of the Irish party. There were, some of them had taken to drink or, uh, but they were people who had lost the will to survive. They just, saw no purpose for themselves. And they, they drifted around a little bit in the 1920s to founded the National League. Redmondism lived on in Waterford uh, mm. and right up until later years, the Fine Gael seat in Waterford was almost always a Redmondite seat based in Valley Bricken. But Redmondism itself or the Irish party, I think it was its roots, it was just swept away and it, it appeared party in the in, in the national in in the um, in the mid 1920s and the center party which was the first party to try to break the mold of our of the two party Irish system in the 1930s was amalgamated into Fine Gael uh, and very few some of us po politicians turned up in different parties but its wipe out was pretty total it remained just in in various local authorities, strong in Monaghan, where James Dillon held the, the old party seat, Donegal as well, but, but, but the roots weren't particularly deep. And it, the, the, Interesting though, just a quick word, Martin, on, on De Valera, because De Valera yes. at one stage was in the Irish Parliamentary Party, wasn't he? Well, he was an Irish party supporter and that was part of his credentials um, in seeking the mathematics um, chair in the newly founded um, UCC. But even more curious was that uh, his opponent in the uh, Clare by-election, um, standing for the parliamentary party, um, he, he became his attorney general in 1937. And of course, uh, Jenny Wise Power, who was, um, uh, you know, went back to the Ladies' Land League in the early 1880s. She was pro-treaty, but she ended up uh, a Fianna Fáil senator. And of course, the principal architect of the Constitution of 1937 was John Hearn, um, who started off um, his, uh, he dipped his toe in politics in 1918, um, again for the Redmondite party. So not all the Redmondites went to Fine Gael, let's put it like that. All right. Fascinating footnotes. Uh, to come to you, Margaret, then, there were elections to the new Northern Ireland Parliament in May 1921. Why did Sinn Féin leaders like de Valera, 
at that stage a Sinn Féin leader, and Collins, among others, contest that election in Northern Ireland. They thought it was politically the thing to do, I suppose. Uh, they weren't going to um, concede ground to the remnants of the parliamentary party there. And it was, as Martin said, also a pact election. So there was, you know, developing from earlier pacts. This one wasn't quite drawn up by bishops, but it almost was. Um, and that aspect of it was treated with um, a lot of contempt by some Sinn Feiners who felt that, uh, you know, kind of going for a pact agreement or even being seen to be uh, managed in that way was to give up their independence. But the ones who got elected, Margaret, from Sinn Féin, I think there were six of them in all, including De Valera and Collins. I mean, most of them are pretty high profile figures in the South. Why did Sinn Féin not have more penetration in the North? Because the Irish Parliamentary Party had been revived through the whole Devlinite political machine over the previous decade. <laughs> Joe Devlin. Had people like, yeah, Joe Devlin. You'd had people like Kettle, okay, albeit briefly, uh, in Tyrone. Its roots went much deeper, uh, particularly in Belfast. It was deeply embedded. Uh, it was, its links with the church were clearer. And Devlin had been almost the chosen successor, you could say, to some degree, within the parliamentary party. He was the only person of that new generation who ever seemed to get any kind of leverage with Redmond. And Devon was a kind of um, political genius. I mean, the machine he ran in Belfast was extraordinary. So I suppose the, the, the kind of ancient order of Hibernians aspect of things was stronger in the North. Uh, in kind of genealogy, in political culture, in marching culture. And, and is it also the case, Margaret, that Sinn Féin had no coherent Northern policy? They had no clear plan for achieving a united Ireland. Well, I think this is kind of ahistorical, this notion that Sinn Féin should have had a plan to counter a permanent partition that nobody could have believed would be the case. Do you know what I mean? Like, obviously, all of Nationalist Ireland had some difficulty in understanding the Unionist culture of the North. But the other side of that is that first past the post did conceal Protestant minorities all over Ireland. So there were places like Cork, parts of Wexford, around Leash. You know, it is not un the, the notion that the very presence of Protestants and Catholics side by side on the island of Ireland screeches partition immediately is very much a post 1920s notion that right. we have absorbed and repeated like a mantra for almost a century, I think. Morris, was the South on a totally different trajectory at this point? I can't say that, but that is what happened. Certainly, if you look at Irish society in the 1950s, and I take my own, because I'm old enough to have grown up at that time, and if I remember the community in which I grew up, there was about a 15% Protestant population mm. in the small town, uh, they were generally seen as being somewhat better off. Both communities were wary of each other. There, mm. there, there was friendliness, but wariness. And for example, in Bagnestown, my hometown, there were a couple of Protestant shops where Protestant people would do most of their business. Most of the motor garages were run by Protestants. Sport was very much segregated. There was a rugby club, a hockey club, and a cricket club in Bagnestown. Uh, and there were GA clubs. Very few Catholics uh, were, were in. Well, that's not quite true. There were Catholics who played rugby, cricket, and hockey, but the majority were Protestants who did not uh, play any play Gaelic games. Uh, so there was a good relationship, but we thought they were very different, and they thought we were different. And um, none of us, either the Protestants or ourselves, had any idea about Northern Ireland. We thought what was happening up there was wrong, that there should be Irish unity. We had no idea how it might happen. And that was how we grew up. And to most of us, and I remember being, you know, in my early days in politics, when the troubles were really starting in the North beginning, 
that right throughout the Dáil and the Senate, there were very few people who made any real effort to get to know the North. The North. Martin would be a huge and very honourable exception. And, and, uh, and you, 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 yourself, uh, Morris, would, would have played a part. But can I... Can I just pause? Can I just pause you there and take sure. you back to what to what Margaret was was talking about, and that is Sinn Fein's attitude to a United Ireland and how it might come about. Can I bring you back, Morris, to the negotiations that led up to the Anglo Irish Treaty? Uh, why did and I, and I appreciate that we're we're going back a, a few decades, but it's an important question to follow on from what we were saying about about Sinn Fein. Why did the Irish delegation, Morris? In those negotiations leading up to the anglo irish Treaty, why did they concentrate on symbolic issues and seemingly avoid questions of partition? If I could just focus on that for a minute. It is one of the mysteries and the analysis of the Dáil debates afterwards showed that in, in doing what they did, they reflected the views of most of the Sinn Féin party at the time because most of the members, virtually all of them spoke in the debates and very, very few mentioned uh, the North. So that I think that the leaders of the delegation were reflecting the, uh, the, 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 the priorities of the, the um, party which they led. Maybe others will have a different view on that, but that's how I would see it. Um, well, uh, indeed, most of the discussion was on the constitutional relationship of Ireland to the Crown and to the British Empire. I mean, I mean Margaret, in your view, was the South slow to see what was happening? Well, it depends on what you mean by slow, because the Northern Ireland Parliament was only opened five months when the treaty negotiations were taking place. Now, it was there, it was evident. But if you were a, a, an All-Ireland Nationalist or a Southern Irish Nationalist, you mightn't have processed that this event was going to be permanent, unchanging and last decades. You know, it does take people quite a while to process political change. Um, did they, I mean, I think it's, as Mara says, there probably is a lack of interest in the North, maybe. But rather than that being the case uh, as a determinant of their actions at the time, I think that, um, I mean, they did get a boundary commission. I think it's quite interesting that they managed to get provision for a boundary commission. Now, they may have deluded themselves of what, what the potential outcome of that could be. And, you know, they, they're not, not really discussing Ulster at all in discussions. If you go through the account, I mean, it does, you know, it's like, we won't go there because that will close the debate or we'll discuss Ulster for this period of time. Uh, but I mean, you know, it is a factor. Obviously, the whole idea of having fought for the Republic um, and sovereignty and allegiance and the oath, well, that's symbolic and immediate, I suppose, especially to so-called frontline people. And they have to right. be aware of that. And then I suppose this, pa I mean, I just, I know I'm like a broken record, but political arrangements are related to power and the power to make decisions and such the only people with effective power in this period are actually well Lord, Lord George is constrained all power is constrained by other positions he's constrained by the Tory party but at the end of the day the decision making power is Britain uh, and not some Sinn Féin representatives from and, Dublin. And M Martin, w was there any attempt by the, the Irish delegation to use the issue of partition tactically? Um, well, I think there was an intention of doing so. But I mean, there's a very political aspect of this, which is often isn't referred to. I mean, Sinn Féin in the sort of 1618 period was castigating the Home Rule Party for having sold the pass on partition, particularly in June, July 1916. Uh -huh. When it came to the treaty negotiations, they were embarrassed. They needed they needed fig leaves. Um, the Boundary Commission was something that sort of pushed things down the road. I mean, there was a lot of talk about this principle of the Long Committee, the essential unity of Ireland, um, I mean, which led to this sort of rather contorted um, Stormont having to um, opt out of the Irish Free State, you know, a day after the treaty came into effect on the 6th of December, um, at 1922. And you see, I think that that's that that that's something that 
they really wanted to sort of conceal uh, because, I mean, the result, as we all know, was a hard partition uh, for a hundred years and arguably still running, even if softened a little bit by um, what happened um, in, in, in 1998. But I, I think that political aspect has to be um, taken into account. Now, just one other point is, I mean, there was one deputy, Sean McEntee from Belfast, uh -huh. who devoted his entire speech uh, to how partition was going to last and how Britain was going to uh, shore up um, uh, the Union in, in, in Northern Ireland, and it reads very presciently today. Uh -huh. Okay, he was, he was, of course, the son, I think, of a Belfast spirit grocer, and <laughs> half of them had been burnt out in the previous two years. Mm. Uh, Kiva, uh, the whole issue of, of the Irish representation and, and, the, and the approach they used. I mean, there is a, there is a question, and, and the Boundary Commission has been mentioned. The, the question is, why did they put their faith in a Boundary Commission whenever Lord, Joyce had, Lord George had made it clear that Ulster would not be coerced? But there is another question, Kiva, and that is, why did those delegates not stick to the clear instructions they had to break on Irish unity and not on the issue of sovereignty? Well, you know, I think we have to bear in mind the the atmosphere of the delegations and um, the exhaustion the delegates were feeling. You know, Margaret made a an important point about you know who was who was wielding power in in how the delegations the how the negotiations were conducted. I mean, these negotiations are conducted in Downing Street. They're not in neutral territory. There was apparently some. Um, discussion around the fact should they all kind of go off to Scotland and have the negotiations up there but no the, the negotiations are held in, in Downing Street the delegation the Irish delegation are constantly or are regularly traveling back and forth to Dublin um, you know they are for obvious reasons they don't trust um, you know the telephone they want they, they they're liaising regularly with cabinet colleagues in Dublin and, and they're back and forth a few times and sometimes they're almost literally coming straight off you know the, the boat train from Hollyhead into Houston, into Houston Station and straight over to Downing Street to keep up the, with the negotiations. So, you know, I think we shouldn't underestimate the strain that that they were under. Um, I think also, you know, that strain is exacerbated by the sort of the Trump card, you know, that that Lloyd George played on the night the treaty was signed, which is to warn of immediate and terrible war. And, you know, I, I gave a talk la la last year where, in November where I, I, I kind of delved into that a little bit. And, you know, what the big question is, is this a bluff? Is this reality? You know, Mar or Martin pointed out nobody nobody in Britain was going to fight for Fermanagh and Tyrone, but they might have fought for keeping the whole of Ireland associated with the Union in some way. Um, and this comes back to the question of whether the break is over part unit is over partition unity or whether the break is over sovereignty. And you know, the British are are drawing up elaborate memorandas, um, making plans for flooding Ireland with you know tens of thousands of troops, making plans for um, an identity card system, um, serious constraints on travel out of Ireland. You know. What what we what happened in 1920 and 21 in terms of martial law might have only been a drop in the ocean compared to what 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 they believed might could unfold um, at, had the treaty not been signed. So, so you know, I think we have to. So in that in those circumstances, if you see a sort of a life raft which could be a boundary commission, it's understandable how you might think yes, this this will give us what we want. Oh. And the boundary commission was also one of these kind of nebulous. Um, items that were yet to be determined, you know, the terms of references of the Boundary Commission, how those terms of references would then be interpreted by the commissioners. You know, this is the whole question of whether wishes of the inhabitants, how those wishes of the inhabitants would be, um, you know, balanced with the so-called, you know, economic reasons. So, you know, I think the Boundary Commission is a bit of a life raft for the delegation. And given all the strain that they had been under um, from the opening of the negotiations onwards, I can, you know, I think it's understandable why they grabbed onto it with both uh, hands. Thanks, Kiva. Would you agree with that briefly, Morris Manning? Well, on the Boundary Commission, my, my sense is Kiva has made a very important contribution there, which I think was the, the strain people were under. T events were happening very rapidly. Ten years earlier, very few of them had been in politics. They had no political training or background. And that's one of the factors in the, in the treaty as well, where they were up against some of the most experienced, uh, hard-bitten politicians in the empire. So there was this, and 
Likewise with the Boundary Commission, it had been shelved. Meanwhile, the new government had to fight a civil war, had to start rebuilding or building a state almost from scratch, had to develop foreign affairs, a whole range of, of, of institutions, recruit civil service, demobilize the, the army, uh, set up the police force, the courts, all of that. Meanwhile, there was no money. It had to repair all of the physical damage done. This was all happening. And all the time, the earlier part, their own lives were in danger. So you're talking about, I think, by the time we get to the Boundary Commission, people who were so fixated on doing what they could do. And what they could do was to try to build up the state on solid foundations. Yeah. What they couldn't do really was anything about the border. So Owen McNeill is often, it's often said he was too fine an instrument, too fine a mind. He was, he was the wrong person. And he probably was. He was the representative on the Boundary Commission. He was representative of the... The Irish state. representative. Yeah. And McNeill is an extraordinary man, one of the great scholars, and uh, he's left us a great legacy in the Irish Manuscripts Commission and a whole range of scholarly things. But he wasn't a bruiser. Uh, he probably wasn't the right person to lead the delegation. But I don't think even a bruiser uh, would have got much further than McNeil did. All right. But my sense is that the focus of the government had shifted away uh, from the from the, from the boundary. M Martin, I want to go, I want to go back to the the, the situation of southern Protestant southern unionists, I should say, in, in all of this. Uh, did they have a misplaced faith, Martin, in the British? Um, I think up to a point, like. Uh, colonial elites uh, later on um, uh, I I in Africa. But I mean, they should have learned from the American loyalists, uh, you know, uh, they were, if you like, abandoned by the British in the 1770s, uh, 1780s and went off to Canada. Um, so, you know, in the, in the last analysis, while there were people, obviously, particularly among the diehards, for example, I mean, the painter, uh, Mainy Jellett's father was a very hardline um, uh, unionist uh, MP in, 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 in Westminster. Um, but, you know, Realpolitik, I'm afraid, um, um, uh, took 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 over, and I mean I, the, the reaction of Churchill to some of the people who wanted to reconquer Ireland. Uh, you know, have all those Irish MPs back at Westminster? Never. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, I, if you like, and I, I think it probably in some ways it was it was a good thing. Uh, um, you know, Southern Protestants had to fend for themselves, and I think actually the overall result is often sort of depicted in a exceptionally sort of gloomy terms, which I don't think is justified. Yes, things were very difficult, uh, you know, over the sort of four or five years, 1919 to 23 and so on. And, uh, you know, there was uh, some, some, some difficulties subsequently, but actually um, I think, you know, the community has managed to survive a hundred years. And, but but um, unlike Catholics in the North, Unlike Catholics in the North, well, the minority there, I mean, they every... were not, Southern Union, Southern Protestants were not seen as a threat to the state, were they? Well, they were a threat to the state, but I don't think that they were sort of, if you like, apart from in, in legislation, perhaps um, uh, sort of seriously discriminated against either. I mean, the, they, were, they were in an economically more advantageous position on average. Um, uh, than most of the rest of the population. So, uh, in a sense, there is no parallel between, say, a minority of under 10% and latterly well under 10%. Um, and, uh, you see, I think where, where the unionists' mistake, perhaps, was, was they, they got everything they wanted in terms of the, you, you know, the territory and so on. That's the Austro-Unionists. Yes, Austro-Unionists. The 35% minority. I mean, that is very large. Now, things stayed reasonably quiet, one could say, like border campaigns and the like for 50 years. But sooner or later, that was going to be a source of big trouble. And I, a few a few intelligent unionists realised that, but most of most of them didn't. That, that is so Margaret, interesting. Margaret, do you want to come in there? No, no, I just think that's so interesting because Arthur Balfour kept saying, four counties is a better idea. 
And if they'd gone for four counties, they would have had a considerably lower uh, nationalist minority. And uh, the South would have had a considerably higher, perhaps, yeah. unionist minority. So, so the, the, the size of the northern minority presented a problem over time because it was so large. And also it almost solidified the South because 10, 12, 13 percent. And OK, it's not very commendable and it was reduced over time, but it, it's an elegant size for a minority, yes. if I could put it in peculiar terms. You know? <laughs> and, and Margaret, how, how do you see the position of Southern Unionists in all of this? Well, I'm kind of interested in Southern Unionists and in Southern Protestants. I'm interested in, you know, they're not identical, you know, no. but uh, Southern Unionists, well, they made their adaptations, I suppose, through the Senate. Um, but I suppose most of the Protestants in the Senate, or a large number of them, were actually Southern Irish Protestant nationalists, people like Alice Stopford Green, people like Yeats, uh, you know, people like maybe Grattan Esmond, slightly different uh but so southern irish you know i mean I, I agree with almost everything that morris has said i believe the cultural ethos of the state that emerged by the 1930s was overwhelmingly influenced by the power that the catholic church uh had entrenched itself within with the collusion of all of the main parties and that it can't have been particularly desirable or congenial for you know many southern irish unionists just to, just i think quick... the other thing the social and economic thing meant that if you were a middle or upper class southern irish unionist you might educate your sons abroad or your daughters abroad. And so there is, a, there is a, a, I think, a tragic loss to the modern Irish state of many very talented people of that background who for cultural and social and just familial and generational patterns and reasons were lost to Ireland. And, you know, you suddenly read about somebody you go, oh, his grandfather, you know, so, so there, there's a loss of a lot of very interesting people, which is... But, but, but don't underestimate the intermarriages and so on in no. sort of eroding, particularly in the mid-20th century, when uh -huh. the barriers were falling uh, uh -huh. and they all became they became Catholic. So it, not not all of them went, went abroad, you True. know? I, I suppose Morris's point about the segregation in, say, Bagnallstown, it probably did precede hmm. the 20th century. But nay temere, that notion... Uh, was very powerful, was it not, for the Protestant community? Up to about the 1970s, yes. I was about to say, up, yeah. Up to that, an that's a lot the, of the 20th yeah. century. Just, just yeah. a final word on this, Morris, if you would. On the position of the Southern Unionists, yeah. Uh, the, 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 the Southern Unionists, by and large, politically, were very conservative people. Yes. They, they were not roaring for divorce and abortion <laughs> yeah, and no. so on, and they became, often were very offended that this assumption was made, uh, that they, for, for example, on divorce and so forth. So I think that just the, the, the change came, really. There has been a huge, not assimilation, but simply the issues that divided people in the 20s and 30s don't matter anymore. The communities don't have the need to feel, but to feel uh, they're strong, but there is still a Protestant vote in some constituencies, mm. and it's an important factor in Dunleary, in Rathdown, in Monaghan, obviously in Donegal, and in quite an, and West Cork. You will have constituencies where there is a residual Protestant vote, and the Protestant community did elect its own candidates, its own people in Donegal, in West Cork, uh, the Dockrells in Rathmines. So there was always a small number of, in the early stages especially, of TDs and senators, but TDs who would speak quietly if Protestant interests were affected, but they didn't do it loudly, they were very polite. <laughs> we, as, we, as we come to the end of what's been a fascinating discussion, I have one question, uh, and it in a way leads on from what we've been talking about. I have one question for all of you. Let's start with you, Kiva. Who were the winners from partition? Were there any? Well, um, you know, there's probably, we might need to break that up a little bit and think about short-term winners versus longer-term winners. 
Um, you know, I agree with the discussion that has preceded this, you know, the unionists, the Ulster unionists, you know, gained territory, solidified it via instruments of, you know, extreme executive power, like the Special Powers Act, which allowed them to, you know, keep, keep, um, you know, nationalists, dis disloyal nationalism at bay uh, for, for 40 or 50 years. Um, of course, then when that began to break down, as it did in, in the 60s and on into the 70s and 80s, you know, their position, that position became much more untenable. Um, I think I agree that the, the southern state was much more politically, culturally homogenous than, than it would have been had partition not occurred. Um, so then if you think about winners, you might want to think about losers, um, you know, southern Protestants. I agree with the discussion, you know, have kind of maintained their, you know, sort of alternative nostalgic communities for much of the 20th century. And, you know, I think we, mu we must continue to think about Southern Protestants as at least having, or Southern Unionists as being in some way a kind of transnational community. And there's clearly a lot of mobility back and forth across the Irish Sea for education. Some come back, some don't, some, some marry and, and stay over in Britain. Um, but but I think the great losers are, are northern nationalists who are you know who are just fundamentally um, cast stranded on on the wrong side of the border and don't have the kind of material social social and economic benefits that southern unionists had who were disproportionately you know more secure had more property had more business interests and so that allowed them access to to corridors of power at least to be listened to in corridors of power. That didn't happen for Northern Nationalists. So, so yeah, those were the losers. I'm, I, I think. Martin, the winners. Well, in a sort of a way, um, you know, the Irish state, because it was a, a partition. Unfortunately, was a condition of it coming into existence. Now, I think you could argue um, it was some time, partly due to entirely external circumstances, before it was able um, uh, uh, to find to find its feet. But I mean, certainly, the vast majority of people, um, uh, you know, look back in the round on the last hundred years with a degree of, uh, of satisfaction. And I think we shouldn't think too much about um, uh, unionists. I mean, the people, I mean, unionism had, had no had no point from 1922 on sort of South Port. Yes, there were people of a unionist mentality. I mean, the principal of St. Columbus College would still tell de Valera, the Taoiseach, uh, in the late 30s that um, uh, they considered themselves to be British and so on. But I mean, that all, that, 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 that all, fate, and the Irish Times, I suppose, was a sort of uh, you former union Unionist paper, very critical of Carson, by the way, um, <laughs> until uh, until the forties and fifties, when it kind of changed its tone um, uh, to a, to a, to a much more 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 liberal one. But I mean, I agree. I mean, the losers uh, the losers were the Nationalists because they were kept out in the cold, and uh, the cold house. Um, for Catholics, as it was uh, was put, I mean, what you do in a cold house, you go and try and find somewhere warmer. And I think it was the intention. My father interviewed some of the cabinet ministers um, in the 1930s, unions for his government of Northern Ireland, and uh, their their hope was that um, uh, Catholics and nationalists would, to a large extent, the problem would go away. <laughs> Margaret, winners. I, well, losers. I think the losers were, I think we are losers in the present. I think the whole island is a loser from the process of partition. The obvious losers are the nationalists of the north. But actually, in the long term, if you think of the political system that was put in place in Northern Ireland, if you consider the way money was funneled into it, the way in which the British government did not keep an eye on it, the practices of power that became embedded in, you know, what Paul Bew calls, you know, kind of political forces and social classes, that cross-class bond within unionism, I think made for a very unrealistic political culture and a political culture that's found it very hard from the 1960s to adjust to processes of change, to ideas of equality, and um, so, yeah, the loser is the whole island of Ireland. Partition, I don't think, helped anybody. 
uh, the short term losers were the nationalists of Northern Ireland. In many ways, the unionists of Northern Ireland were losers too, because they were placed in this position. And, you know, most people would have behaved in the same way had they been, been in their position. But it's hard to share power after a long period like that. And Morris? Well, I'm a football supporter, so I look at winning and losing in fairly black and white terms. And the only person who got what he wanted in its entirety was James Craig. He yeah. was the winner on the day. Uh, now, that day has cast a very long shadow. Uh, Things didn't have to be, and Margaret, Margaret mentioned some of the factors there. Uh, things didn't have to be as bad for the nationalists as they were. And for, for that, many people are culpable. Uh, and we could spend the rest of the night asking why. We could also have said, and Martin mentioned the uh, unionist ministers saying that they hope that, as I understand what you were saying, that with time, the differences. And when I was a student in the 1960s, working with unionist uh, student fellow students in pea canning factories in England, getting to know them, getting drunk with them and trying whatever, um, failing, um, I had a strong feeling that, if all, that in time we would become very similar, we would be able to work together. And then the troubles came and the British government was always too little, too late, and we're not going into that now. <laughs> it wasn't inevitable that, 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 that what Martin's friend's vision of what might be, that that mightn't have happened, but sadly it did. And then Morris, who do you support? Oh, me, uh, yeah. Leinster, Leinster Rugby. Uh, right. Ipswich Town in football, Carlo footballers. <laughs> Gaelic football, so but that's it. <laughs> okay. Off station, oh. Morris. <laughs> Off station there. <laughs> Keeps you busy. Yeah. Uh, listen, everybody, we have sadly come to the end uh, of our discussion, and I want to thank all four of you very much indeed for the insights you've given us for the rigor with which you approach this. And I'm deeply grateful to you for that because it was an, extre an extremely rigorous exercise that we put you through. And you brought your expertise to it. You brought your fluency to it. Uh, you brought your deep knowledge to it. And for that, I, I'm sure I speak on behalf of everybody who's uh, been present at this event tonight. We are extremely grateful. So sadly, that's where we must come to an end. Um, my thanks to the Linen Hall Library, of which I am proud to be a governor, for asking me to, to chair this evening's session. I think I'm right in saying it concludes the library's look at the momentous events around uh, the Division of Ireland. And what a fascinating uh, number of events it has been. We've tonight considered Southern perspectives, and I hope that that's been illuminating. In fact, I've no doubt it has been for all of you who've been present. So Morris, uh, Kiva, Martin and Margaret, my thanks on behalf of everyone to you. And that's where I'll now say good night to you, our guests, and good night to everybody online and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.